A lot of good information there, uh, things to watch out for, trade war, we've heard a couple times today. Uh, what I really liked was Fed and no movement predict, projected, at least in interest rates. Um, a lot of good stuff, a lot of stuff he started talking about there at the end, ADR, occupancy, rev part, the like. We'll hear about more tomorrow morning uh, with STR, Jan Freitag, and Mark Woodworth of CBRE. Uh, at this point in time, Let's talk about the state of the industry. Uh, I'd like to welcome the stage Teague Hunter, no relation, uh, and his panel. Thank you. All right, all right. Let's do this. Ah, thank you guys for all being here. Uh, Teague Hunter, president of Hunter Hotel Advisors, and. Uh, conference host so big thank you to you guys for being here 31st year we couldn't do this conference without you quick plug uh, everybody thank Nancy Pete and Brink if you walk by her this week because uh, we couldn't do it without her so I'm a personal thank you to Nancy um, I'm excited to be here today great time to be in the industry as always uh, we say that a bunch and uh, thank you to my panelists uh, I think this industry is as a family business. I grew up in it. I mean, it is a family, but I think it's one of the best industries that we're in. Everybody comes back year after year, uh, and I think we make good friends as much as good clients and customers and good business relationships. So it's a wonderful industry. Thanks to all you guys. Echoing that point, these guys are all my friends. We're going to have a casual conversation, I think, amongst all of us. Uh, you can tell they're all friends, so they're going to probably cut up uh, and ask each other questions, so chime in and join us. Uh, first, Dan Hansen, Summit Hospitality, uh, CEO, publicly traded REIT. Jim Merkel, Rockbridge, CEO, private equity firm. Tyler Morris, MCR, private equity firm out of New York. And Scott Treblico, Managing Director of Blackstone. So these guys control billions of dollars worth of hotels. Uh, I like having them up here. I like talking to them. The reason I think it's relevant is I want to know what they're doing with their billions so it trickles down to Main Street as well and the things that we're doing in our everyday lives. Uh, Scott, I'm going to start picking on you. Uh, I think you've got the largest uh, headline out there today from everyone. If you don't know, Blackstone has just announced they've completed or are close to completing their largest fundraise ever, uh, Blackstone 9, I think it is. It's a $20 billion fund. That's a lot of money. So I won't ask you how fundraising is going because I think I know the answer. Uh, but my answer is, what are you going to do? question is, what are you going to do with all the money and how are you going to spend it? Well, thanks. Thanks, Teague. Yeah, you're right. Um, it's a lot of money. Um, and we're blessed to have, you know, a lot of great capital providers that, that trust us and, and, uh, and we're excited about it. Um, you know, we think it's a great time in the industry. And, you know, a lot of that money is going to go into asset classes outside of hospitality, um, which I won't spend a lot of time focusing on given the audience here. Um, but hopefully a good amount of that money will go into the hospitality um, sector as well. I think if you look back historically, over all of our funds in 25 years, about a third of the capital has gone into the hospitality space. Um, and my goal um, is to try and continue to keep up that track record. I think if you look at uh, what we've done in the last year or two, I think we've been fairly selective in terms of where we've decided to deploy capital in the, in the hotel sector. And I think it's, it's a function of you know, our view on the industry. And I think if you look at you know, the highest level, we feel extremely good about hospitality. Demand is at all-time highs, occupancy is at all-time highs, despite that alternative accommodation is also at all-time highs. And so you know, we feel really good about it, but at the same time, you know, the industry is, is going through a period right now, we think of moderation, um, and there's certain things that are, that are impacting flow through. And so we're being you know, cautious in terms of where we put it out. Uh, we've been you know, focused fairly heavily in the resort segment over the last couple of years, you know, really focused on coastal markets, Hawaii, California, Arizona, Florida, Texas, places like that. And we're also actively putting money out into the select service segment, which you know, we have been doing for several years now, and we continue to do. Um, in addition to the, to the fund you mentioned, we also have another vehicle, um, which is called BREIT, which is a permanent vehicle and is focused a little more on income, which we're also raising money and, and buying predominantly select service assets in terms of the hotel allocation into that space, and we'll continue to do so. I, I got to pick on that. So as, as totally separate fund is the B-REIT that they're raising through broker-dealers, different animal, we won't get into that, but how much you're raising a month, if I may ask, in the B-REIT? 
uh, I think, you know, if you look out, I think what's disclosed in the public, some, you know, $250 million thereabouts a month um, today, and, you know, that's been heavily allocated towards kind of industrial multifamily sectors and probably 10 to 15 percent into hotels. Um, I'm probably not doing as good a job as I should uh, because I'd like that allocation to be higher. But this is, it's a challenging environment right now to find deals that we think are really compelling, um, just given some of what we're seeing in terms of underlying performance with you know, moderating top line, EBITDA is relatively flat, and so we've been hyper-selective in terms of the markets um, and the type of real estate we're, we're willing to put out. Who, so I'm gonna stay there. First of all, did everybody hear two to 300 million a month, 250 million a month? That's incredible. Uh, so help me out though, pick on, compare hotels versus the rest of the market, because you guys are seeing real estate, global real estate all over, not just US, but everywhere. How is our hospitality sector holding up to comparison to multifamily, office, industrial, et cetera? And how hard are you having to fight internally? Um. I think it's holding up well. I think you know there's, there's different there's different sort of secular tailwinds that are occurring in other spaces. I mean, industrial, you know, you're seeing significant rent growth right now, and it's continuing to accelerate in certain markets. And Last Mile is obviously being incredibly robust. Um, apartments are just an incredible asset class, and there's a huge housing shortage in this country, and so we feel good about fundamentals there. And we focus a lot in the B space where there's really not a lot of development. Select service. Um, I would say it feels to us in the last 12 months yields have compressed in terms of where people are willing to sell. And I think what we're seeing is the growth and fundamentals are, I think, getting slightly worse in terms of the EBITDA growth that hotels are generating. And so we've been narrowing our focus to markets where we see outsized growth um, and generating a little bit more than what the US is, is achieving. Um, but I would say we, we feel like the the yield that you need to achieve on a hotel, you know, the gap to multifamily and industrial is probably two to 250 basis points in terms of out of the gate because the growth profile over seven years is, is quite different. Fascinating. What do you underwrite a hotel to? Um, it depends on what vehicle it's going into, but I would say, you know, for a, call it a 60% leverage deal, um, a select service hotel today, would like to see it getting low double digit cash on cash yields out of the out of the gate. So you can do that if you're buying a $130 rev power hotel that's, you know, relatively young and CapEx is going to be 6 or 7% of revenues. You can probably buy that for a low to mid 7 cap and you can generate that type of return. Jim, what are you underwriting to? Um, we, we're looking at under uh, unlevered returns, but you know, 10, 10 is probably uh, where we bottom out, and that's if we buy a hotel that doesn't need a lot of capex, and we can generate cash flow, and we can look to the cash flow to generate the the overall return. If we're doing a development deal or a deep turn, you know, it's got it's got to be in the you know 11 to 12 range unlevered in order to get in the high teens and above on the return. We're a value add uh, fund, so we, you know, we're targeting 18 and above returns. What kind of deals are you finding? You having trouble finding them? And give uh, us some examples. So example, um, well last year, bought a hotel from Tyler. Hey, that's the first. Yeah, so. Yeah. Um, you made a great deal. Yeah, Terry, it was a phenomenal <laughs> deal. Um, you know, one of us is gonna be smart and, um, but the truth is, is that for funds, I mean, we have the same thing. We sell uh, hotels that we've held for a while that need a renovation or need um, where we've created the value. We can sell it and there's still uh, opportunity there. That's what we, uh, there was enough of a renovation there that uh, we felt like we could uh, create a little bit of value. Um, we just bought a, um, an independent hotel in, uh, in Cherry Creek in Denver. Um, and that, um, I'm sure a lot of you have been experiencing the, the cost inflation of development and um, as we have, and, and so we saw an opportunity to uh, buy a hotel that was uh, two years old that we felt um, had uh, cash flow and some operating efficiencies that we could drive and um, generate value that way. But um, you know, I think the you know we we have a pretty broad mandate of uh, being able to look at select service, full service, independent, branded, 
and uh, we're just trying to find our spots to create value. Are you, Jim, do you see your Rockbridge, you guys gonna be net buyers or net sellers this year? Uh, this year, uh, right now, we're net sellers, but th not for uh, any other reason than uh, we sold a portfolio and, and we're always buying and selling properties. Um, we tell our investors that, um, you know, we, uh, you know, that we're in business because owners love to take money out of properties and not put it back in, and consumer preferences change. So we think there's always opportunities to add value and and um, and realign a, a property. So we think um, we'll we'll end up doing about uh, 15 deals this year, um, uh, which is uh, a little bit more than we did last year. We did, I think, 10 or 11 last year. Uh, acquisitions. Acquisitions. We also lend, um, yep. so we're doing uh, we're doing loans uh, to um, uh, to developers and, and owners that uh, a lot of takeout facilities yep. where we can uh, return return equity back to a developer at CO or shortly thereafter before the cash flow is in place. Give them a bridge loan to uh, uh, to a permanent vehicle. So uh, if you guys are gonna do buy 10 to 15 deals, how many will you sell? So um, right now we've, uh, we've sold 15 this year. So we think we'll do 15, so we'll probably be net neutral, but right now we're, um, you know, this last 12 months, obviously, but. Um, Tyler, same question. You guys net buyers, net sellers? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, we're net buyers this year. We'll probably buy, uh, the plan is to buy about 22 or 24 hotels this year. Uh, we bought 26 hotels last year. Um, so, you know, we, we think it, there's still plenty of opportunity out there. Uh, I think a little probably different from Scott um, in that we're market agnostic. Um, we just do the hotel space. Um, and I always describe the real estate business uh, like a hand. Uh, there's what's described as the big four food groups, uh, multi, industrial, retail, and office. Uh, and then there's hotels. Hotels are the thumb. They're the one that's not like the other four food groups. These guys just collect rent checks uh, and 20-year, 10-year, 5-year, and 1-year checks. And it's a yield play, right? And we can debate uh, for a very long time <clears throat> what the yield's going to be but the yield is commensurate with the term. Uh, hotels have one-day leases. Uh, it's a branded business. It's an operating business. Um, it's a real estate business. Uh, there's a high finance degree to it. Uh, there's a ton of places to add value. Uh, so our approach is we're vertically integrated. Um, so our alpha, uh, if you will, is adding value through the operations. Uh, I think a little uh, similar to the way Jim approaches the world. Um, and uh, a lot of hotels uh, are owned and run by dentists. Uh, and, you know, dentists are terrific people and I like them cleaning my teeth, but uh, they're not great hotel owners. It's a wildly fragmented industry with 57,000 hotels in the United States. I think they're owned by 30,000 people. Uh, so that creates opportunity. Whereas if you go into multifamily, you go into certainly office and industrial, uh, there's much greater concentration. You have the prologists and the EOPs uh, and the EQRs of the world. Um, and so I think there'll always be plenty of opportunity in the hotel space. So uh, while everybody is piling into Nashville and Austin, uh, and everybody's buying hotels in Austin and Nashville at $450,000 a key, uh, we're avoiding those markets. Um, right, Nashville is going to grow like a weed for a long time, so is Austin. Um, but, you know, this is not a state secret. Uh, this is like the most overbuilt hotel market in America is Bentonville, Arkansas. Uh, right? Because everybody said, oh, well, Walmart's there and they're big. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, but everybody knows that. And so everybody built a hotel there, so it's oversupplied. We actually own a hotel in Bentonville, so I'm acutely familiar with this. Um, but uh, we, we try to go where other people are not and try to add value through operations. So we can continue to buy, and we'll buy at a I six. I wasn't quite following that. Were you going to Bentonville? Are you wanting to go to Bentonville? No, I'm trying to avoid Bentonville. Okay. Uh, there's and too much supply in Bentonville. No Nashville, no Austin. Now they describe Bentonville with Rogers. Future, that's a totally separate Austin. market. Yeah, uh, yeah that's that? right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so you can put all the flag families again in Rogers, uh, which is, you know, a couple miles down the street from Bentonville. 
Um, Tyler, I mean, you own a lot of select service hotels, mm -hmm. and I've looked at a lot of your select service hotels, um, and I can but vouch I see you've never bought it. Uh, no, it's because you're a great <laughs> operator. Um, I guess I'd, I'd be interested to hear, you know, some of your secret sauce. Like, what are the select service hotel? It's a pretty basic box. I'd love for to hear your thoughts on what are some of the things you do differently. You think to to, to move the needle? Um, well, I, I think. From an operational standpoint, uh, we have a mantra in our company. If you walk into a Hilton Garden Inn uh, at 9 p.m. and there are two people behind the front desk, uh, ask who owns the hotel because we'd like to buy it. Because uh, that means it's overstaffed, uh, right? And you see that a lot, uh, right? There's not that many people checking in at 9 p.m. You only need one person behind the front desk. Uh, hotels are notoriously uh, overstaffed. Um, you know, this, the hotel industry is the second oldest business in the world. Uh, and it came short, uh, quickly on the heels of the oldest business on the world. And there is a, uh, there's a mentality that this is the way it's always been done, this is the way it's always going to be done, and uh, I'm going to just follow the path. So we try to deviate from that. Uh, we buy a ton of hotels uh, from people that have 1.5 par. Uh, on their linen and terry. Uh, and they think that they're saving money on linen and terry by not spending the money on the sheets and towels. Uh, but what they end up doing is they create um, 47 minutes uh, per occupied room of housekeeping time because the housekeepers have to take the linen and terry downstairs, wait for it, and then bring it back upstairs. Uh, so we run about 26 or 25 minutes uh, per occupied room. I mean, you got to invest in the hotels, but this is an endemic problem. And I can tell everybody here this, uh, and I guarantee you that half of the hotels in the United States will be under parred uh, for the next decade. It's, it's just endemic in the business. So it's these little things. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of um, the facility fees. And, um, you know, there, there's a um, fee in, that you're allowed to charge in the state of Texas. Um, I think it's a dollar and a half per occupied room. Uh, most people don't know about it. Uh, so when we underwrite deals in Texas, uh, right, there's a little bit of juice there. Uh, and that goes a long way in a 150 room hotel. Uh, so it, it's kind of death by a thousand cuts. There isn't some big macro strategy, uh, right? You gotta get under the hood, pull back the covers, and go through uh, every little one of these line items uh, to find these little Easter eggs. Dan, how crazy is Tyler? Um, <laughs> how much time do we have? Um, no, Tyler's not crazy. He's, he, as, as Scott said, he's, he's a great operator. And I, I think you know, everything he says is true about the details. And I think that's what separates the good operators from the, the bad operators. And um, going back to what uh, Scott said earlier about uh, opportunities kind of in the low sevens to mid sevens, that's provided that they're not a good operator, right? That there, there's there's got to be some sort of opportunity for value add. That's what we're all looking for, and uh, so I don't want people to walk away with the misconception that um, the guys on this stage are the the, the last buyer here. We uh, uh, I think we all have a little bit different view. Um, we look. Uh, as many did early on in the cycle at you know opportunities to underwrite properties that were growing and 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 uh, you know had runway and now we're faced in an environment with uh, expense growth uh, greater than revenue growth and it's hard to underwrite you know upside there so we've kind of taken the the point of looking for brand new or broken brand new with the ramping story or broken where we can do more value add um, but no I, I don't think Tyler's crazy I would like to know um, if lodging is the thumb who was the middle finger I don't, which <laughs> industry was that well it's a great question it goes by uh, order of lease length okay uh, office buildings, uh, so excuse me, industrial are 20 years, office buildings are 10 years, retail is five years, and multifamily retail, is one gotcha. year. gotcha. Right, and the yield corresponds. It's the lowest with industrial, and then it goes up, and our uh, hotels are one day leases, uh, so we have the highest yield, but we also have the highest volatility, right? So the trick, we've been in a no volatility cycle for 10 years. Uh, right, I think that's kind of lulling people into a sense of security. Um, 
right? Because this is the longest uh, growth cycle that the United States has ever had, but you're seeing signs of cooling. So we'll see what that means from a bank perspective and an operating perspective. So when's it going to end? I mean, we heard just, I don't know, two panels ago or whatever, uh, I think Greg Mount said, we just had the recession. And a minute and a half later, Corey said, the recession's coming. I, I think the industry peaked three years ago, and every year it's kind of the same story. Tyler, we debated the cycle two years ago, and we went beyond innings to cricket, I believe. Cricket. Yeah. So it's a three-day game. It's a three, yeah. I, I think it's, uh, um, but there's always going to be opportunities. Um, I don't know if we're entering recession and the bottom of recession. I think there's definitely challenges ahead. I do think there's enough talk about if they may, we may will ourselves into a slowdown. I'm not sure if it goes to full recession defined as you know negative GDP growth. But I don't think that means that there's not opportunities. I just think that means uh, it's hard. And Jim and I were talking earlier. Uh, I was asking him if it was if he if he like us felt it was harder today to find opportunities, and he said, "Well, it's always been hard, and it has, but uh, I do think the challenges we're faced with a prolonged uh, low rev par uh, is an environment that uh, we haven't operated in uh, in quite a long time, if ever, uh, consistently low rev par, and we're finding uh, general managers uh, that have have not had to have their finger on every little expense item, and I'm." I'm sure all of you are feeling it in some of your hotels, and I've talked to some owners and operators that have called me and said, gosh, I, I can't make this model work anymore. What are you guys doing? How are you finding good talent, and how, how, do you, how much are you paying you know, housekeepers and, and housemen? And, and those are common themes, whether it's a small hotel or, or a big hotel. You know, the use of contract labor to try to fill in the gaps is, is creating a model that uh, is very hard to do. So um, I think it, it is a challenge. Um, I, don't, I don't know that I would uh, ascribe that there's definitely a recession coming, but I think you have to be prepared for uh, a continued uh, uh, state of, of where we sit today. Yeah, I think that as it relates to the recession um, or a downturn or whatever uh, that we're late in the cycle, and nobody can predict uh, what's going to happen in the future. And um, uh, going into 16, uh, the, all the forecasters were forecasting that things were going to go down the following year, and then Trump, then Trump won, and that's their excuse for not being right. But the forecasters, uh, it's very, very difficult uh, to forecast, and I think what we've tried to do, uh, you cannot predict the future. You try and manage risk variables, and um, and focus on the downside and um, and stress your stress your deals so that uh, and capitalize them well if you capital if you're well capitalized um, you're not going to get the high teens returns but you're going to get high single digit low double digit returns if you are well capitalized in and obviously if you uh, go into the right projects with the right amount of discipline um, because you can't you cannot predict when a downturn's uh, going to come and if you do you sit on the sidelines and you know you miss opportunity well so i think there's uh kind of three big risks or not risks but uh, things that are definitely affecting us right now you're seeing wage pressure uh, across the united states uh, we've raised wages in every single one of our hotels uh, in, across 65 markets uh, over the past year and a half. It's very hard to find uh, good team members. Uh, the unemployment rates are at all time lows uh, and it's absolutely affecting margins. Uh, the second big thing is property taxes uh, across the border going through the roof. Uh, cities and towns are figuring out that this is a great source of revenue from commercial businesses and it's, it's wildly outpacing uh, inflation. I don't think there's anything that anybody does about that. Uh, and then there's supply, and you've seen consolidation in the industry uh, with the Hilton and Marriott flag families. If you go on Marriott.com and you Google New York City, uh, you get 185 hotels. Uh, you know, that's a lot, uh, right? You know, if you're on page 10 just of Marriott.com, 
uh, you know, that's going to be, uh, you're not going to get a lot of bookings out of that. That's problematic. So Marriott has 30 brands, Hilton has 19. Uh, at NYU, they said they're going to announce a 20th, uh, right? They're, the brands are coming fast and furiously. Um, so, you know, you, you may see some secular shifts. Um, depends on how powerful the Bonvoy point system is. Uh, versus the Hilton point system, if that's still driving a lot of rooms. But then on the positive side, uh, more people are traveling than ever, right? Last year, there was 4.4 uh, billion trips taken. Uh, that was an increase over the prior year of 280 million air trips, a pair to pair uh, air trip, right? That's a lot more people traveling, right? Spirit Airways is terrific. Uh, they're char they charge 39 bucks to go from New York to Florida. I mean, you can't beat that with a stick, uh, right? That's causing more people to travel. So the incidence of traveling, so that the macro wins are at uh, our back on this thing, um, but you just gotta place your bets wisely. The other side of the, the wage pressure, which everyone talks about is, it's a highly competitive job industry and the psychology of these employees is in a very positive state right now. I mean, consumer sentiment continues to be incredibly strong. Wagers are going up and the consumer is reinvesting their capital into, into experiences and into things and, and it's helping the economy. And if you think about you know, the state of the corporate industry, companies continue to invest. Infrastructure feels like it's just around the corner. The Fed just announced this afternoon that they're not going to increase rates this year at all. And so there's a lot of things that are going to continue to support growth in the economy here for the foreseeable future. And there's sort of idiosyncratic things that are, you know, important to the underlying growth of an individual hotel or a collection of hotels. But if you just think about the demand side of the equation, it feels still really strong right now. And it's coming off, it's coming off a little bit, but it's coming off a pretty good place. I'm curious what the other panelists are experiencing from a construction cost standpoint, because you know over the last three years we've delivered a lot of renovations and uh, struggled on a lot of budgets, um, and uh, just saw you know big uh, big increases in um, in the cost because everybody's busy, and um, and then they're outside of major markets. If you're outside of major markets, the subs aren't wanting to travel, but they will if you pay them a lot. Um, and so I'm curious as if, if you guys are seeing that uh, flatten out, um, if you're still seeing the big increases in costs from a yep. construction standpoint. <clears throat> I mean, conservatives, we're seeing costs go through the roof, construction costs. Uh, you know, some plus 8%, some plus 10%. They say, the official statisticians, which I don't believe, uh, that construction costs have gone up 5% per annum for the past eight years. Uh, I think it's higher than that, but even if, it, even if that's accurate, that's a big number, right? When GDP's up 2%, 1% in those early years, right? It's costing more and more to build out. We built a residence in in Florida. It cost us 185,000 a key. Uh, we opened it about two and a half years ago. I mean, that's replacement cost. When I first got into this game, you could build a residence in for 100,000 a key, right? And, you know, uh, in the FDD, we'll tell you that it's 115,000 a key. Nobody's actually building it for those numbers. Uh, right after you put soft costs in, land, consultant costs, political costs, uh, all that kind of thing. I mean, you know, and costs are going nowhere but up. But there's one thing that's for certain, construction costs are not gonna go down. And the big, the big factor is in 09, uh, when I talked to all of our construction guys, uh, a ton of the small players were flushed out of the industry, the small construction guys. So you got rid of all that competition and they never came back. So there's fewer players. So when we bid jobs, there are just fewer people uh, to bid it to and they're busy. And the subs have not staffed up because they can make as much money with less aggravation than right. And yeah, the, staffing up the their other, teams. The other part that adds to that is time. Everything's late, you know. So it's not right. just the cost; it doesn't get done on time. And uh, these uh, a lot of these subs are they have the ability to just you know 
that you don't have another option. So uh, they can turn down a job if it's too small. You know, if you wanted to redo a lobby, you might have a hard time find a sub, and you may spend a lot, and it may be a, a week late or a month late. Um, but all that extra time adds cost too, because your rooms are a service longer. And you know, I don't know very how many construction projects were done on time, uh, but I think they've across the board been over budget and, and uh, uh, gone on longer than expected. And that's, that's part of the, the challenge here. Uh, takes a lot longer to get through the city. Entitlements take longer, so what you used to be able to build a, a hotel and you know from start to finish in you know less than you know uh, even a year uh, early on when, when I got started, now you're into two and a half, three years and maybe longer. Yeah, I don't know what's actually happening because you hear about uh, the number of franchise uh, franchises that are getting signed and development in the pipeline. I had an interesting conversation with a, a, a general contractor friend of mine that said 2018 they thought was going to be a great year uh, because they went into the year fully uh, deployed and then they had a, a pipeline to pick up uh, the second half of the year, but, this, but the, set, the pipeline didn't get started. The jobs didn't get started. And so they had a mediocre year. So that was kind of frustrating for me. I'm like, if you're not making money, who, who's, who's making money uh, on, the, on the delay? But it's, it was interesting to me that um, jobs are, are deals and developments are taking longer to get done. And then I think there's also people are re-underwriting. They're getting the numbers back um, in you know, the middle of last year. And, and having to figure out how to get the rest of the equity and, and uh, pull the deal together because I think the costs have been coming in uh, a lot higher um, and uh, struggling to get started. But isn't that also a benefit? Because that's I think so. keeping I, supply I somewhat in check? Well, if you look at the last, you know, I don't know f how many years of star forecasted supply growth, right. every year it's high and ends up materially below. Um, you know, by half a point or whatever, where demand still is outstripping supply growth. But going into the year, last few years at least, um, the projections have been that they were uh, going to be in equilibrium or supply would be more. So I think but it's. Development can be a sickness too, right? We've all been there. Right. Right. It's, I was traveling with uh, a developer friend of mine and, and looking at hotel project and. Uh, he said, what do you think? And I said, well, it was the same thing I told you the first time we talked about it. I was like, I don't think this makes sense. And, and uh, he said, well, I said, why, why are we talking about this? He's like, because I really want to do this. And I said, well, no. I says, do we have to have like an intervention? Do we have to get you all together and say, look, if, if it doesn't work, it just doesn't work. Let's go find one that does. There are development opportunities that work. Um, but uh, I do think that we, we are in a, a situation where uh, we're, we're continuing to stretch to try to make the math work on development. And you know, sometimes it's changing that exit cap rate because if you change that cell, magically everything works. Uh, and, and the banks just don't buy off on that anymore. You know, when you're when you're your construction costs go up by 20 percent, and you go to the bank and and they're say, well, how do you? 60% or 65%, we're not going to loan on an, a new number. Um, and the way you fix that is by changing the rate. And how do you justify that in an environment where rates are hard to get? And uh, my concern is there are, the downside is there are going to be some really great hotels that open up. And those investors that are looking for that return uh, on their capital are maybe only going to get the return of their capital. And that's not what they signed up for, for you know two, three, four, five years. And um, I do think there's still great products out there. I know there's a lot of new brands. I think uh, the brands have started to be a little bit more flexible. and. Uh, making things a little bit more authentic and, and local, which, which is good. Um, uh, but when you've got a brand new hotel that's opened up, uh, um, it, it's, it's going to be competing with all the other ones in the market. So I, I do think there is a point where development, uh, just back to Jim's original point, the, the costs have gone up that's going to make some projects unfeasible or less feasible. Dan, I think you should go easy on developers. Developers are a very emotional bunch. I know. <laughs> and, you know, you could really push them off the back of the cliff if you're not nice to them. <laughs> We've all been there. Sometimes you define yourself by the deals you don't do, the deals you pass on.
you know, I've, I've passed on some development deals that, you know, early on uh, in 07 that would have been horrible deals, right? There's, a, there's, a, there's always a time to lean in, uh, but it's not, it's not all the time. I thought this is when you were going to ask Tyler about his TWA hotel development. Speaking of an emotional bunch. I think everybody's heard about it. It's everywhere. <laughs> I mean, you've got better marketing than anybody. You know, we've gotten more uh, PR on the TWA hotel than the last Olympics. Very happy about this. I was yeah. unaware of that. Uh, so when yeah. you ask if Tyler's, <laughs> if I think Tyler's crazy, I might say crazy smart, but definitely not crazy. So <laughs> he's done a, he's done uh, a fantastic job with that. Yeah, well, the, the, the TWA project is a unique uh, project, but I think it speaks to how we approach uh, our select service business, uh, a lot of our full service hotels as well. Um, we try to do things differently uh, at every uh, turn. So, for example, at TWA, uh, we are not going on booking, we're not going on Expedia, uh, we're not on any of the OTAs. Uh, if you want to book a room, you have to go to TWAhotel.com. Uh, we're not going on the GDS. Uh, you know, here's a great example of the second oldest business in the world. Uh, why the hotel industry still offers AAA discounts to anyone who asks? Does AAA even still exist? Is that still an organization? Like, is there a guy that comes by and changes the tire on your car? Uh, you know, uh, but yeah, it still well, exists. It's, it's it just does. does exist. It does, it does exist. Yeah. It does exist. <laughs> I don't drive. Uh, <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Um, right, but there, there's so many anachronistic things in the hotel business that people don't revisit and people are scared to cut off the AAA discount. Why? Why, why are you offering every guest in your building a 10% discount? They're already in your building, uh, right? It's not driving them to stay with you, um, right? And it depends on your competitive position and, and uh, who you're competing with and what's down the street from you and uh, your relative location. Will you have loyalty, a loyalty program at nope. TWA? No, no, loyalty program is a huge waste of money. <laughs> <laughs> Should I just have one channel, the TWA.com? That's right. All right. Friends and family, right? Yeah. I'm Friends sure. and family. Okay. Yeah. Friends and family for you, Dan. <laughs> uh, but no, we, we took a lot of different approaches from construction. Uh, we do all of our own marketing and all of our own uh, public relations. Uh, so we don't farm it out. Uh, nobody is as good as uh, you are. Uh, at representing your hotel. Uh, our compensation programs are uh, predicated on success, um, right? Not success of the whole enterprise. I had a funny um, uh, conversation about this. I talked to the Marriott folks, and they said, uh, you should uh, do an autograph collection at TWA or one of those kind of things. And I, and I said, well, how much is it going to cost? And they told me, and I said, well, that seems like a lot. Uh, I don't think we're going to do that. And uh, they said, well, then how are you going to get uh, guests? And I said, well, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, you know, I, I hope they come from the 185,000 people that fly out of JFK Airport every single day. I think it's a pretty good demand driver. And the 50,000 people that work at JFK and the 3.5 million people that live east of JFK, setting aside the Manhattan uh, thing. And I, I think there's plenty of demand drivers out there. But the, the fundamental corpus of this is, uh, the big companies have uh, these global sales forces, and uh, IBM goes to Marriott and goes to Hilton and says, hey, I'm doing 800,000 room nights this year. I want a volume discount. Very reasonable ask. But the 800,000 room nights are spread across thousands of hotels. So if, if you're driving all that business at the TWA hotel, I'm happy to give you a discount. But why would I at TWA give you, IBM, a discount for staying in Atlanta in a hotel that's owned by somebody else? Right, the, um, right, the, the micro versus macro. Um, so, you know, they're all very uh, product specific, market specific, et cetera. But, uh, you know, thinking about this with a fresh look on it, um, you know, and that's uh, gonna help our margins. Uh, Dan, give me, I want to hear from the public company. What are you telling your shareholders, stockholders about the future? What did you predict for 2019, uh, et cetera? Yeah, uh, we pr provide guide, yearly guidance, and we uh, have a, a range of 0 to 3% REVPAR, just like most public companies. Um, 
Uh, some a little more, I don't maybe they're not. They're, most of them are a little lower than that. We, we have you select have service. in your office cranking that out, that zero to three percent? Yeah, it's, it's real high level math. So <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's been a, a challenging environment for a lot of the public REITs. Um, this should be a better year. Most of the public REITs have exposure to San Francisco, which is, you may or may not know, the convention center was clo or closed and under renovation. So that's coming back online and uh, that's given I think the public reads a little better narrative to talk about growth for the year, uh, but there's still some markets out that um, that uh, challenged with you know great supply. Uh, we talked about the labor and the property taxes, so you know our range of kind of zero to three I think is probably close to where Marriott and, and Hilton have guided uh, for RevPar for the year. And, and a fun stat that I like to share, and I'll form it in the phrase, phrase of a question. The question is sort of how is the company different from seven years we've been public? So how are you yeah. different today from when you started? So we went public uh, eight years ago, uh, 65 hotels. We sold now 58 of those, uh, and we have 75 hotels. So we've averaged a transaction and a half a month or so. Um, so it's a little different. Uh, yeah, so if my math is right, of the 65 hotels you went public with, you, own, you still own seven. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, it's, uh, we, we've tried to, we were a private company uh, early and uh, we went public. We tried to bring, you know, some of the things that were successful as a private company to the public environment, which is not believing that anything's a forever asset, you know, finding opportunities to create value and, and finding opportunities to, to sell and do that over again. I think the, the read in and of, of itself, the real estate investment trust was designed, you know, for individuals to buy into real estate without having to buy one building so they could get into diversification, but that didn't mean they had to buy into real estate that never did anything and just sat there. So we've tried to be a little bit more thoughtful about, you know, our investors' use of capital, and that's put us in a position where uh, we've had opportunities to, you know, take profits and uh, kind of shift our focus to different markets and different gro growth opportunities. As I said before, we, 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 we like to think that there's some value add. We do a lot of our own project management, uh, construction, and, and purchasing a house, so we also have our, our own uh, revenue management team. So there's a lot of work that goes on beyond just putting capital out and, and buying hotels. Jim, any thoughts on 2019 and beyond? Sure. Um, no, I think that uh, 2019 is, is going to be a, a steady year. Uh, and I think we've talked about a lot of what everybody is experiencing from the increase in costs and the, and the demand. Um, and you know the public REITs being zero to three percent, I think everybody, from what, uh, from the people I've talked to, feel good. They just feel generally good, and they're cautious but uh, optimistic and and trying to do things. Whereas a couple years ago, I think people were much more fearful um, of a recession. I think people are. Um, are, are trying to do things, and I think it's uh, I think it's there's reason to be optimistic in our industry, but you always you always have to be cautious. Tell I'm coming to you next, but I, I'm going to chime in. I, we were in New York in December, you know, doing the Christmas parties and walking around, and I, it, the stock market was collapsing at the time, and everybody in New York was freaking out. And I would say, dare I say, hotel values were dropping. We don't have, fortunately, a ticker to show that, but values were dropping. And flash forward January, and wow, we're all back to normal. No issues, no concern, all good. But I, I think you are seeing uh, a, a much more regional hotel market. Um, you know, we own a bunch of, we're the largest hotel owner in West Texas. Uh, it fell off a cliff, uh, and now it's back to above pre crisis levels. Uh, Houston is struggling in a big way right now. Um, New York City is not back. Uh, the first two months of the year, New York City is down 8% in RevPAR. So uh, it's bad. Uh, there's a ton of new supply. Uh, we'll see what this means uh, in the latter half of the year. January and February are the worst months of the year. Um, but you know, you see these little micro markets. Uh, Austin and Nashville uh, are going crazy. Uh, Salt Lake City is having a terrific year. Um, Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis is having an awful year because it had the Super Bowl last year. Uh, so it's comping against the Super Bowl. So you just see these little micro changes, but the macro uh, is very positive. Trump bullied the Fed 
into saying no new rate increases this year. There's plenty of debt capital around. There's plenty of equity capital around. Uh, and the macro fundamentals, I think, are pretty good. So, uh, you know, all things being, well, I'll take a zero to 3% growth uh, over a 5% growth. Uh, because I remember distinctly well in 2006 and 2007 when growth was 5 and 6% of RevPAR. I mean, it just went like this, and then it went like this. So uh, give us that kind of long, slow, tepid, lousy growth. Uh, that, that'll last a long time. I mean, Teague, you mentioned December. I was, I was sitting on a beach back in New Zealand watching the screen thinking I better rest now because it's going to be busy when I get back. Um, because we just, we just fundamentally have a different view as to what the market was thinking. And so for me, I was, sort of great opportunity. Dislocation in the public markets is great for our business. And, and unfortunately, I came back and it had changed again. Uh, and now it looks very different to what it did, did three months ago. We, we, we feel good about where things are heading right now. Um, 2019, 2020, I mean, who knows, but from what we're seeing in terms of the data, things feel good and, and we'll continue to focus on trying to find the, the best deals that are out there. I love it. Uh, we've run up our time. Uh, we could talk forever. We'll continue this conversation at dinner tonight, fellas. Uh, thank you all for staying. We're standing between you and the bar. So thank me, help me, thank these guys for being here.